been baptized, I want you to know that if you're wondering what your next step is and where do I go from here, this is it. This is the one that Jesus has called us to. In fact, Jesus himself was baptized. So if you're wondering, this is it. And um, we're actually going to keep this up here and we'll have an opportunity for those who uh, should just say, you know what, screw it. I'm getting in. I don't care. I've got my clothes here. I'm just, let's do this today because it's that important. I need to take my next step of faith. We're just going to keep this tub up here. It's not going anywhere. So today at the end, if you want to do that, we're going to do that. Is that cool? Is that all right? Can we do that? All right. Awesome. Um, so today I want to kind of open with a story. We're, we're, we're wrapping up a series that we've been in for four weeks now that has honestly probably been one of my favorite series that we've ever done. Um, it's called You Got This. And we've been talking about um, the obstacles that we face in our lives and how God uh, helps us to overcome them. And uh, we've been looking at the book of Joshua. But before we get into the details of the scripture, I want to share a little story to kind of open things up. Um, One of the things that my wife and I discovered about our little three-year-old boy when he was probably around two or so, maybe one and a half, is that what he needed when it came to bedtime was a routine. Now, I don't know if any of you have little kids. If you haven't had kids, you may not know this yet. But what happens when you don't give little kids a routine is like every single night, all of a sudden, bedtime is a huge, huge fight. Because there's no order of operations. There's no, like, preparing them to go to sleep. And so all of a sudden it's just like, all right, let's go to bed. And they just flip out and it doesn't work. And so that was the case for our son. So we developed this bedtime routine for him that involves, like, watching a show and eating a snack and brushing your teeth and going potty. And one of my favorite parts of the bedtime routine, if not my favorite part, is that um, after all of that's done, but before we put him in his bed, one of us takes him into his room and we sit in his little rocker with him And we tell him stories. We just sit and tell him stories. And sometimes it's a story from the Bible or I'll I'll uh, I'll turn like one of my favorite stories that I really I think I'm going to try to get published one day um, for kids is uh, I tell the story of the Good Samaritan, but with monster trucks instead of like people. It's really it's awesome. I think your kids would love it. We're going to have to do that sometime. Um, But uh, so we'll do story time and we'll just do all kinds of stuff. Sometimes he'll have us make up a story or sometimes he'll tell us the story he already knows. And uh, not too long ago, I started telling the story of the tortoise and the hare. I was like searching for something like he wanted more and more and more. I'm like, all right, I got to give him something. And so I kind of turned to Aesop's fables and started talking about these. And and uh, and so the tortoise and the hare um, in our house is the story of the turtle and the bunny. Of course, he's three. You don't know what a hare is. And so, um, you know, it's the it's the turtle and the bunny. And so we'll sit down and I'll be rocking him and and I'll say, you know, the 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 bunny came to the turtle one day and he said, you know, let's have a race. And so they lined up at the starting line and they said, on your mark, get set, go. And I say, Whew. and there goes the bunny and he's gone. And there's all these sound effects and the turtles crossing the starting line is going, dude. Do, 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 do. You know, and so like every time I mention one of their names, like I'm doing these little sound effects and stuff. And I talk about how the rabbit, he runs so far ahead that he he looks behind him eventually. And he realizes he's so far ahead that the turtle's not even in sight. And he says, I got this in the bag. I'm just going to take a little rest. I'm going to take a little snooze under this tree in the shade. And so that's what he does. And he lays down there and all along somewhere way back in the distance. Do, 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 right? Like there's the turtle um, following behind. Rabbit sleeps and he wakes up. He looks behind him. The turtle's not there. He looks ahead and he sees the turtle is almost at the finish line. And he jumps up and he goes and races toward the finish line. But it's too late. Here comes the turtle across the finish line. Right. And so like so we go through the whole story and I had actually done this with him a couple times. So he was familiar with the story. But one day I told him the whole story. And at the very end, I did what you do with these fables. And you say the moral of the story is what's the moral of this story? Slow and steady wins the race. Right. Yeah. So slow and steady wins the race. And so I'm like and I was like in the moral of the story is slow and steady wins the race. And he didn't react just kind of looked at me for a second and I and he kind of looked away from me a second it was thinking and about five seconds after I said that he just goes no way (laughs) and I'm like I'm like and I'm like oh shoot I have to explain this to him now see because my Micah my little boy he is my little Ricky Bobby redneck racer kid and he wants to go fast all the time you know what I'm saying like I want to go fast if you ain't first 
you're last. Then that's how he thinks, right? And so, like, like, he, like all of his, like, favorite cartoon heroes are, like, race cars, like Lightning McQueen and, and jets and, like, things that go fast. That's all of his favorite stuff. And so, like, I was like, oh, my gosh, I have to explain to this kid, like, why all his heroes are wrong, you know. And, uh, no, I didn't do that. But, but I was trying to explain to him. I'm like, I was like, no, I said, it's not that he's going fast that's the problem. It's the fact that he's inconsistent, right? Like, the fact that, that he, he chose to stop. He got off to a good start, but then he didn't finish well. And, see, I think for many, many believers... Uh, at least at first, I think the problem is, is that, that for us, faith is a way to get off to a good start, but we, we forget that faith is also supposed to help us to finish well. Like, to finish our entire lives well. With, with every step of the way, we're supposed to be walking closer and closer with God, and we're supposed to be walking with Jesus and following Jesus. And this is something we're supposed to do in our whole life. Jack, who got baptized today, it's, it's going to be a walk. It's, it's a progress. And, and there's nothing better than being on the other side of that, but it's still a walk nevertheless. And there's just a lot of walking and a lot of consistency, and you can't stop, and there's a lot of endurance involved. It's not about starting fast. It's about finishing well. And what we're going to see today is that the Israelites uh, in the book of Joshua are put in a situation where they're going to end up doing a lot of walking. They're going to do a lot, a lot of walking. But if they don't continue their progress, if they don't keep marching forward, if they don't keep trusting God and keep moving forward, then the obstacle that's been placed in their path, they're never going to overcome it. That, that the one thing I know for certain about your life and mine, right, is that if we are faithful to God, He can absolutely help us overcome any obstacle in our path. But what I'm absolutely certain of is that if we give up prematurely, we won't see it happen. So we have to keep going, right? And so um, we're going to jump into the book of Joshua. I'm going to start just kind of explaining some of the background here. So um, basically what we've been covering the last four weeks is how the Israelites crossed from the wilderness into the promised land. There was this special land that God had designated for them hundreds of years earlier, and they were moving from the wilderness area to the promised land. But last week we talked about the fact that there was this insurpassable obstacle in front of them, which was the Jordan River. And it was overflowing its banks, and it was deep, and it was dangerous, and it was nasty. And the Israelites came to it, and when they couldn't have gotten through on their own... God made a way for them to get through. He stopped the flow of the river. It all dries up and they march on through and they get to the other side. Now, that's great. It's cause to celebrate. That's exciting. Now they're in the promised land, something they've been wanting for so long. But as I shared a couple weeks ago, the problem within the promised land is that Israel's enemies were there waiting for them. That this was not an uninhabited area. This was not an uninhabited nation, but there were cities all throughout this place. Fortified cities with warriors inside of them that were ready to kill an Israelite at any opportunity that they had. And here the Israelites march into their enemy territory. And this is the promised land. And I was thinking about it. Last night a couple of, uh, a couple of guys went to... Um, these MMA fights. We went together and we went to check out these fights. And I was thinking about how um, the difference between boxing and MMA is like in boxing, you get into a ring and you step into the ropes and you can step out of the ropes. Like if you really were afraid of your opponent, you could just be like, peace, and just like jump out and you're gone, right? Like I'm out. But in MMA, they put you in a cage. They put you in a cage with an enemy. They close the door behind you and they put a pin in it so you can't get out. That's what they do. They lock you in the cage with your enemy. And that's what the Israelites had experienced. They walked into the promised land. God had opened the Jordan for them. But guess what? It didn't stay open, did it? He closed it off behind them. So so, so they're in the promised land. It's been closed off. They're trapped with their enemies. And now they're just faced with another problem. And I think some of us, our mentality is, God, why am I going through all of this if I'm just going to keep facing problems? Like, what's the point of making progress if it's just going to be one problem after another? And I think the the thing that we need to get out of this is the fact that progress doesn't eliminate our problems. It just gives us a different set of problems, a better set of problems, if you will. Right. Like like what happens is basically um, here. Let me get let me get to my notes here real quick so I don't 
mess this up too bad. So, so when many of us come to Christ, we sort of have this, this idea in our mind that if we give our lives to Jesus, God is going to start blessing us and he's going to take all of our problems away. Everything's going to be cheesecake and rainbows from now on. And it's just going to be the best thing ever, right? And like, that's our perspective of it. But I want you to think, just honestly, think about the Bible for a second. Even though, even if you know only a little bit about the Bible, what we know about Jesus in particular is that his life was both perfect and filled with problems, wasn't it? He he lived a perfect life, sinless life, did nothing wrong, only loved people all the time. And yet it was filled with problems. The Bible describes him as a man of sorrows. He was a man who was constantly being criticized, who was constantly being attacked by people, even threatening death, who, who was constantly being um, chased around by people who wanted healing, so he barely had a moment to himself. He was working with stubborn disciples who wouldn't listen to him and would doubt at times. I mean, this dude's life was filled with problems, and yet his life was perfect. And so what I want to challenge you, I want to challenge for you a shift in mindset. Is that, is that when it comes to faith, the goal, is not, the goal is not to have no problems. The goal is just to have the right set of problems. And, and specifically, one of the things that Jesus tells the disciples is he says, he says, in this world, you will have what? Trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. And, and like a few weeks ago, we were talking about how the promises of God are what get us through sometimes. Well, that to me sounds like a promise of God, is that in this world you have trouble. And we sign up for this Christianity thing, and we're like, that's not the promise I signed up for. In this world you will have trouble. But he follows it up by saying, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, see, it's not about, like, the, the progress that we're making and the problems that we're faced with. It's not about the problems, it's about who we get to face the problems with. The question is, are you going to do it alone or are you going to do it with God? Because I don't know about you, but I would rather rather face a mountain with God than a molehill by myself. I'm going to trip over that thing. I'm going to find some way to screw that up. And God and God is like, this mountain is nothing to me. And so we need to pick our problems wisely. We need to pick the problems where we're walking, we're walking with God and we're trusting God and we're obeying God just as the Israelites were and we're following God because he leads us into the problems, but he also promises his presence. And there's nothing we can't do if God's presence is with us and if he said he's going to do it. Amen? Is that right? All right, sweet. All right, good deal. Now, so, so they walk into um, the, the promised land and we're going to pick up the reading here finally. Um, and this is... Uh, I'm working off two sheets here. Here we go. Uh, Joshua 5, starting in verse 1. It says, When all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings who lived along the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River so the people of Israel could cross, they lost heart and were paralyzed with fear because of them. All right? So you can just listen to me. So basically, they go across the Jordan. There it is. They go across the Jordan Everybody, all of their enemies hear about it and they're paralyzed with fear. Like they cannot act, they cannot do, they're just stuck and they're afraid. Now, if you're a military mind like Joshua was, you would look at this and you would think, this is the time that we attack. Like right now, when they can't do anything, they're crippled by fear. Let's go attack them now. But God... Because he's God and he likes to do things differently, he has a different plan. In the next verse, it says, At that time, the Lord told Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the second generation of Israelites. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the entire male population of Israel at Gibeath Haraloth. So, let me get this straight, God. You put us into a position to where everybody's afraid of us. They're paralyzed by fear. And you want me to do what? To what? To who? Right? Like, like imagine being poor Joshua. And it's like, it's like, hey, I want you to make flint knives. I mean, these aren't like your, uh, your chef knives that you have at home. I mean, flint is a stone, right? I mean, this is disturbing. If you're a dude in here, you, you're, you're relating to them right now, right? You're like, no, this is not for me, right? This is not something that I want to happen to me. This is not something I want to deal with. And not only that, but it's like, 
we're going to take the time to do this, but I don't know any dude in here who could have that happen to them one day and get up and go to battle the next. There's going to have to be a healing process that's going to have to occur before the battle is going to happen, if you know what I'm saying. So God is, God is really kind of dragging this thing out. But let me talk a minute about, about circumcision, because it's kind of a weird thing, especially if you, you know, aren't familiar with kind of the Old Testament and what's going on here. Um, so, so circumcision is actually very, very, very important to the people of Israel, because when God made the promise that this would be their land to Abraham, who was their, uh, their ancestor, when he made that promise, he also made Abraham make a promise too. And the promise was that Abraham and all of his descendants would have to get circumcised as a sign of the special relationship that they had to God. That that was the special sign that they were the people of God. And and it, it was so important to them, in fact, that if you did not get circumcised and you were a guy, you were cut off from the family of Israel. Like they would literally just cut you off and you were sent away because it was symbolic of the special relationship with God. And you say, what in the world was God thinking, making that the special symbol, right? Like, can't we get a tattoo or something cool? Like, this is really weird. Like, why are you having us do this? And, and there, there could be a lot of reasons, but I think one of them very simply is what it symbolizes. In a literal sense, it's the cutting away of flesh. It's, it's doing away with the flesh. And in a spiritual sense, it's the same thing. It's saying, I am not going to rely on my flesh and who I am and my strength anymore. My relationship is with a God who can take me far beyond anything I could have ever asked or imagined. Right? He's going to take me places I could have never gone on my own if I had relied on my flesh. And so, both literally and symbolically, he's saying, I'm going to cut this flesh away. My special people are not going to rely on themselves. They're going to rely on me. And it's going to make all the difference as it has for the lives of many of you here. And so that's why they did circumcision. And so, so Joshua obeys God. They, they do this circumcision thing. They, so all of the people, uh, all of the, uh, the men in Israel get circumcised. And, and basically the reason it happened all at once, all throughout the land, is because while they were out in the wilderness, anybody who was born out in the wilderness didn't get circumcised. Like, they were wandering for 40 years because of their sin. They're wandering for 40 years out in the wilderness. And so it didn't happen at that time. And so, so God finally said, look, I upheld my end of the deal. When I made a covenant with Abraham, I said, I'll bring them the promised land. I'm going to bring them to it. But you have to hold up your end of the deal. We're here now. I delivered. Now it's time for you to hold up your side. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so it makes sense why they're doing it here. Not only did they stop to do that, though. And then to heal, they also stopped to observe and celebrate the Passover meal, which I, I talked about a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Rahab. This important um, celebration of the fact that God spared Israel when he killed a bunch of people in Egypt. He, he spared Israel because they were his special people. And so, so they stopped to do all this stuff and all this pausing and all this waiting. And some of, the, some of the cities there might have probably just been like, what are they doing out there? Like, they walk into enemy territory and they just chill for a couple of days. Like, what is going on? And, and, and I think that, like, when I was reading through this, I was thinking about the fact that Israel is between miracles here. Like, we're about to see them go and conquer a city in a miraculous way. And it's right after God had brought them through this river. And they're kind of in the middle. And they're just observing these ordinary acts of faithfulness. And it got me thinking about our lives. And what I realized is that, that it's in the ordinary, everyday acts of faithfulness that God prepares us for the bigger problems ahead. Let me say that again. It's in our ordinary, everyday acts of faithfulness to God that God prepares us for the bigger problems that are ahead. There are things that are in front of you that God, in this quiet season of your life, if indeed you're in a quiet season of your life, He wants to prepare you for now. I used to be an MMA fighter. And one thing I know is that you do not get into the cage without having prepared beforehand. Guys that do get smoked. You're out of breath. Your technique is sloppy. Things are bad. And it will end poorly for you. But in the times of peace... You prepare for the times of war. 
And that's essentially what happens in our daily lives. God has called us to be faithful to him, to, to get into his word, and to, to pray, and to connect with him, and to, to, to be generous, and to be faithful in that, and to serve. And, and all these little things that seem like just ordinary things are preparing us for something bigger. Maybe something better. Maybe something more dangerous. But it's pre- preparation nevertheless. And so, if you are in a quiet season of your life right now, my my challenge to you is to not get complacent with where your relationship with God is now, because He's preparing you already for the next thing. Don't ignore this season of preparation. All right? Don't ignore this season of preparation. So, they get ready to march around Jericho. Uh, The city of Jericho was the first stop, the first city they were going to have to conquer along the way. And uh, so they finally get all healed up. They get everything together. And, um, and uh, something kind of weird happens. They're, they're preparing to go attack Jericho. And the problem with Jericho is Jericho has these huge, un, like, unapproachable, fortified walls outside of it that you just can't get through. In fact, Jericho was famous because all around the city was this massive double wall that totally protected the whole thing. And let me describe it to you a little bit. I did a little research, and this is how archaeologists say it looked like. It starts with a 15-foot or so retaining wall. This is all the way around the city, protecting the city. 15-foot retaining wall, 26-foot tall wall on top of that. That's six feet thick. So if I lay down like this, this is how thick the wall of Jericho was. Okay? That's the thickness of just the the outer wall of Jericho. Okay? Now, that's not all because it's a double wall. So behind that, there's an embankment. So it's basically like a, a hill made of earth that goes up to 46 feet above where the Israelites could stand, 46 feet, and on top of that was another 26 foot tall, 6 foot wide wall protecting the city. This thing was impenetrable. This was Fort Knox. There was no way anybody was getting in there, and we'll see that what happened was as soon as Jericho got afraid of the Israelites whenever they came through, they shut the gates. And their plan was just to hunker down and stay in the city because no one was getting in. Check this out. This is uh, Joshua chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. Now in that day, what they would do in warfare is they would try to starve out a people that were hunkered down in their own city, right? They would basically hang out on the outside until they ran out of food and water. But the problem was this was harvest season, which means Jericho had probably just accumulated a huge, massive amount of food inside their city. And not only that, but there was a natural spring inside the city as well. That's what archaeologists say. There's a natural spring in there. So they have everything they need. I mean, they're just on vacation at this point because those walls are going to protect them, right? And they're depending on the walls to protect them. And so either the Israelites are going to be waiting a very, very, very long time to take the city or God is going to have to do something miraculous. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into town. And there God goes again, asking a bunch of weird stuff of the people of Israel. Go, you know, we're not going to attack this city. We're not going to go at it with swords. We're not going to get the catapults out. What we're going to do is we're just going to walk around it a bunch of times. We're going to take a little hike around Jericho once a day. You know, and I mean, imagine hearing this if you're Joshua. Once a day, just take a walk. Last day, take it seven times and everything's going to be fine. Like, what are you saying? And I think that's, it's an interesting prescription that God would give because I think a lot of times what we find is we find ourselves beating against the walls or an obstacle in our life and just taking the same approach every single time and not making any progress. 
Right? Like, the Israelites could have come at it with swords. They could have come at it with whatever. But it, they weren't going to get through. And, and so God is saying, look, this thing takes a different kind of approach. Are you willing to trust me that my approach is better than your approach? Even though it's weird, even though it might be uncomfortable, and I know there's some people in here today who maybe, you know, you were about ready to give up on church, or maybe you did give up on church, and you're here for whatever reason, and you're just kind of checking out this thing, and you're thinking about Jesus, but you're kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know if this stuff works, but yet you find yourself constantly beating your head against the wall, trying to figure out why the same old, same old isn't changing things in your life. And... And I want to challenge you with the thought that today that maybe God is calling you to trust Him instead of your own way because the same old, same old will just com- continue to produce the same old results. That there's something different He wants of you. That He's calling you into something better, into something new. And so, so, so they, um, they, they begin to march around Jericho just as God said. They trust Him and so they begin to march. And they begin to march. But before they begin to march... Joshua tells them something interesting. He doesn't just say at the end of all this marching, you're going to give a shout. At the end of all this time, you're going to give a shout. He says, I don't want you to speak a word until that shout comes on the seventh day. Like when we're marching around this city, all we should hear is this. And so you can imagine in Jericho how uncomfortable and confusing this must have been. That you see thousands upon thousands of Israelite soldiers, priests, people blowing horns, and all you hear is the sound of the horns and the marching of the feet. No words, nobody mocking them, nobody yelling up saying, we're coming to get you. Just a lot of stomping. A lot of little steps of faith. And the reason I draw that out is because I think in our culture, a lot of times people like to talk a big game first and then try to follow up with it second, and it never works. It's true in the church, too. Like, we're known primarily for what we say. And our message is very vitally important. The gospel is the message of Jesus Christ. But one thing I know for sure is that if we let our feet do the talking if we let our steps of faith do the talking, that people will see Jesus in us before we ever even speak about Him. And I believe that's the way that God would have it. I believe that we are called to take steps of faith and that people would see in our lives that we are being faithful to God and then at some point we will have an opportunity to shout the praises of God for them and to them so that hopefully they can experience the same. But I've come across so many people who talk a big game about their faith, and their lives reflect none of it. I'm not talking about people who are trying, and who are repenting, and who are struggling, and they're doing their thing, but they're, they're making progress toward God. I'm not saying that. Nobody in this room is perfect. Far from it. But I'm saying there's some people who it's all talk, and there's nothing backing it up. There's no steps to support what they're saying. And yet, I, I look at this passage, and I see the footsteps doing the talking first. That's the way I want to live my life. That I, as much as I get up here and I talk to you guys, that I want my footsteps, my actions to speak louder than my words. And I think that God would have us do the same, that our love would ring out loud and clear for the world to hear. And so they're marching around the wall and they're just silent. And so I, don't, you know, I would go nuts because I have like lightweight ADD and we're just walking around quietly around the whole city. You know, like every day we're going to take a hike. Okay, here we go. We can't talk to our neighbors. It's, you know, it's, it's like, what do I do? And so if I'm an Israelite, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking at the wall. Because this is like, it's kind of like when they said the Titanic was unsinkable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Everybody's like scoping it out like, what is so, what, what's so special about this thing? And I think that as the Israelites walked around that wall day after day after day, probably kind of looking for weaknesses as they walked, just out of curiosity, looking for its weaknesses. This thing's supposed to be so great. Where is it? I think that the more intimate they got with the wall, the more they realized how impossible it was to accomplish this on their own strength. Like, like the more intimate they got with it, they realized that this thing really cannot be broken into. That, that, that every time we march around, I look for weaknesses, and they're just not there. There's nothing there. I can't see how I'm going to get through this situation if I were to do it on my own. It just, it just can't be done. And I think in that situation, it would have been easy, 
as they're examining the wall to draw a comparison between themselves and the obstacle. Themselves and the obstacle, and to say, this thing is insurmountable. I can't get past this. But I want to challenge us today that if we're going to draw any comparisons at all, to draw them between God and our obstacle and not us and our obstacle. See, God is much bigger. I read a, I read a little bit of a book this week um, about this march around Jericho, and the author said something along the lines of, you, if you focus on the mountain, you're going to feel very, very small and incapable. But if you focus on the God who made the mountains, you will have no fear and no concern whatsoever that you can get through this. You know what I'm saying? Like, he made the mountains. A mountain to him is absolutely nothing. And so the Israelites, every step that they took was another step of faith. The fact that they didn't quit on day five or day six or on lap three of day seven is astonishing to me. They were faithful all the way to the end. It was their faith that carried them through. It brought them through well. And they get around on the seventh day and they finish the seventh lap and it's time to blow the horns. It's time to shout and they shout. In the walls of Jericho, God makes them just fall down flat like they're nothing. Like they're nothing. Like, 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 like they didn't even exist. They fall down flat. The Bible says that they, they were able to just go straight into the city. They, they just took the city like it was no big deal. They just went straight in there. And, and they went in and, and Rahab and her family, who we talked about a couple weeks, they were in their house just like she was told to be. And they brought her out. Everybody else didn't make it. In fact, before they went into the city, Joshua told them that this, or God told Joshua something very specific that we need to look at. This is important. In Joshua 6, uh, verse 17, it says, Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into the treasury. So, so they come in here, they're, they're taking, getting ready to take Jericho, and, and the walls are getting ready to fall down, and Joshua says, look... Everything here is devoted to God. It's either going to be destroyed or it's going to go into his treasury. Everything here. Normally, when, when, when nations came in and they took over a city, the people got to keep some of the, keep some of the spoils of war. They went in. They, they kept the animals for themselves. They might have even taken some slaves. They kept all the jewelry and stuff. They kept it for themselves. It was the spoils of war. It was something that they had earned. But in this case, God says, no, 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 no. You did not earn this victory on your own. See, whenever you get on the other side of your obstacle, what is your response to God? Whenever you, you know, uh, the most obvious example is whenever you, you get a paycheck. Whenever, whenever you get cut a paycheck, are you giving the best and the first to God or are you giving him leftovers? Are you giving him anything? And this isn't a tithing message, but that's just the obvious example. He said it's an offering to me. There are some things in our lives that God wants us to give Him, and then there's other things in our lives He wants us to destroy, namely our sin. There's, there's things He says, you know, give this to me. Give me your heart. Give me your soul. Trust me with this. I, I'm the one who got you this far anyway. Trust me. And then there's other things He wants us to absolutely destroy. And so He says, listen, do not, do not dare keep these things for yourselves. These are for me. These are the, the recognition that I get for, for bringing you to this situation that you could have never accomplished on your own. And so they go in and they do everything that they asked Him and everything seems to be great. After they destroy Jericho, until they go and they prepare to attack the next city, a town over, which is a town called AI. It's literally those two letters, AI. And, and, and so the, Joshua sends these spies up, and they go to take a look at the land. And, and they're going to scope out this little town, and, and the spies come back, and they're like, Psh! after Jericho, they're nothing. Don't, they literally say, don't even send up all the soldiers. Don't even send up all of them. Send like two or 3,000. It's such a small town. Nothing Nothing is going to stop us from taking this small town. 
Joshua sends 3,000 up. They get their butts kicked. 36 of them die, and they come running back with their tail between their legs. And Joshua comes to God, as we'll see in a minute, and he's just like asking the question so many of us have asked so many times, why? Why, God, why? Why did you make me go through this? And let's read that part together. Joshua 7, starting in verse 7. Then Joshua cried out, O sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River if you're going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side. Lord, what can I say now that Israel has fled from its enemies? For when the Canaanites and all the other people living in the land hear about it, they will surround us and wipe our name off the face of the earth. And then what will happen to the honor of your great name? But the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They've stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they've not only stolen them, but have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. That is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for for destruction. See, what had happened was there was a guy named Achan. Not Clay Achan. Sarah. (laughs) There was a guy named Achan who was there when they attacked Jericho and he got greedy about things that God said belonged to God. And so what, what Achan did is he found a couple silver coins, a couple bars of gold, or a bar of gold, and a, a beautiful robe from Babylon, and he snuck them back to his tent, and he buried them, and he hid them in his tent. Despite the fact that God had told them, that's not the way it's supposed to go. He had taken with him the robe, something that needed to be destroyed, and he had taken with them the, the, uh, the gold and the silver, something that belonged to God. Either way, it didn't belong to him. And what I find so fascinating about this example is that when God came to Joshua and told him to get up, like, why are you blaming me for your fault? He, he, what he says is he didn't say, hey, get up because Achan has sinned. He said, get up because Israel has sinned. Listen, don't be so naive as to think that your sin only affects you. It never only affects you. Even the hidden ones, they never only affect you. Your sin has repercussions that ring out through your family, through your friendships, through your relationships. Most importantly, your relationship with God. It's never just you that's affected by your sin. But the good news is this. That when you're faithful and obedient and trusting in God, that never affects just you either. Does it? There's things that people see in you. That that when you're being faithful and sharing your faith with other people, it changes other people's lives. And there's no greater example of this impact than Jesus himself. Jesus himself was ultimately just one man. He was just one man. But yet it was his faithfulness in serving his Father that has had an impact on the whole world opening it up so that anybody who puts their trust in Him, who receives Him in faith, can have a restored relationship with the Father that can come into the promise, can can come to a new place of peace and joy in their life, can become free, like Jack has found freedom. And I'm not talking about the kind of freedom that's like, you know, know, I'm just kind of putting on a, a painted church face today. It's like the song that we sang earlier. That from the inside out, we have been changed by the power of God. That we are literally a new person from the inside out. If you could stand with me. We're going to worship in just a moment. If you could close your eyes, we're going to pray. But before we do that, I want to give you an opportunity. You know, over this series, we've talked about a lot of obstacles. 
in a lot of the cool and creative and crazy ways that God has um, He helped the Israelites through those obstacles. But the one thing I know is that the greatest obstacle in our life is ourselves. It's our own sin. Because it's that thing that has kept us separated from the God who loves us so dearly that He wants a relationship with us. And my hope and my belief is that there's somebody in this room today who would say, you know what, I need a relationship with my God today. I need to be forgiven of my sin today. I need to be brought to a place where I'm not fighting my battles on my own anymore, but I'm fighting them with God by my side. And with Him, I know I can overcome anything. And if that's you, I want you to know that Jesus died for you. That in His death, He took all of your sins upon Him as if they were His own. And He gave you His righteousness if, righteousness if only you would believe in Him. And so, my question for you today is, who in this room needs to believe and put their trust in Him today? If that's you, if you could just put your hand in the air right now so I can pray for you in just a moment. Is there anybody here who would say, I'm tired of the struggle? of my own sin. I'm ready to move on to better problems today. I see your hand over here. Anybody else? I want to give you an opportunity this morning too. Because I also believe that there's probably someone in this room and then maybe it was you who just raised your hand. But the one thing I know is that whenever we see somebody give their life to Christ in the Scriptures, there's no separation between their salvation and their baptism. It's just something that they do. If they're able to do it, they just do it. Is there anybody in this room today who would say, you know what? I know it's going to be messy. I know it's not super organized. But I need, I need to take the next step in my faith, and that is by being baptized. Is there anybody in this room who would say, I need to do that today. I don't want to wait any longer. They've got the tub out. Let's just do this thing. Is there anybody in this room who would say that today? 